<laughs> Dan and I are just talking about like how the last couple of days have been rough, rough. I hope, I wonder if you guys are feeling the same thing. Are you guys feeling a little rough, a little ruffled? So I've got, got some, got a little funny joke because I figured we all need a little joke to start off the day. So welcome to Cleaning Business Life. Um, seriously, the best cleaning podcast around you guys. If you have not shared it already, why not? What is, you guys just need to share it and make sure to subscribe and download so you guys can come back to it. Um, so this, this reminds me of, you know, those of us that have kids, you're going to get it and you're going to laugh so hard. So I, I was reading this and it says, cleaning your house while your kids are still growing is like shoveling the walk before it stops snowing. I could totally relate to this because, you know, obviously it snows in here in Colorado. And it's like, if you guys are have kids and you know that you clean and you turn around and it's like, wait. I just cleaned all that. And then there's like billions of toys everywhere or the toilet papers in the bathroom and the water is running. And so if you guys can relate, you guys all know, you could feel the pain. <laughs> it's a so constant battle to, you know, to figure that out every, it's every day. It's there's maintenance every day. And then you add in a husband and everybody else that just, ugh. <laughs> I never cleaned, I never cleaned the house until like before my husband got home. Cause I was like, what's the point? I'm like, I'm going to get the toys out and like, they're going to play with it. And then they're just going to like make a mess again. So I just would leave everything out. And then like an hour before you would come home then I would like tidy up and clean everything. Like so perfect. Like this is how the house was all day. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's their oh imagination. God. So today we're talking about the 70% clutter rule. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but when I think of the 70% clutter rule, I think of, and I'm picturing this in my head, you guys, and you guys can picture this head. You guys are walking into this house and it's got like pink curtains and it's got like the little ruffles around the curtains and it's got, you know, the couch, the old fashioned couches, and there's knickknacks everywhere and lampshades that are like, have the little... I don't know if you've seen those, but they're like the lampshades with the cover with the lampshades on it that you can crochet <clears throat> stuff around it. And they have like all these little knickknacks everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's knickknacks and there's magazine racks. I don't know if you guys are picturing all this, but when I think of the 70% clutter rule, I think of like all the clutter. I think of that. I think of all the little knickknacks and clutter. It's pretty wild. Some of the styles of homes, we've all seen them on the internet. And they they filter through every once in a while, like the all pink house. Everything is different shades of pink. Yeah. Or the all purple house. I've seen the all green house, the orange house. <laughs> um, in, inside and out, everything is a different shade of orange or pink or purple, or whatever. Um, so it's always interesting to see what people collect. As um, I have progressed in my career doing what I'm doing now, um, I have no desire to collect anything <laughs> nothing good, I don't want to, I'm, I'm guilty of books uh, that's probably my worst um obsession because there's like all this knowledge and I've mentioned I had an office it was I had an upstairs office and a downstairs office and then I had another office in a different location and my top office people would look in and there was like easily six thousand books and they're like did you read all these I'm like yes <laughs> so, hey Shannon I have a library <laughs> so what what do you think my one collection is Oh my gosh. Well, oils don't count. No. So, um, the no brainer, Shannon, come on, you know me. I, I'm, okay, I'm, I bet you, okay. If, if, if you're listening right now and you guys know me, you know what my one, you know what my one love is? Cluck, cluck, cluck. Oh, chickens. Oh, yeah. Cluck, cluck. <laughs> so I've kind of like taken after my great grandma, which is kind of scary because she had chickens all over her house. She had chickens all over the top, different things. And now I like have this thing. And I don't know if it's just because I want to remember her, but I like collect chicken stuff. But I was a good girl, Shannon. I was a all good of girl. All chickens to Kim. And call her <laughs> send it. I will send you my address. No, I was a good girl. So I went on a purge because I didn't have, usually I have farmer's markets and events all weekend long, Shannon. And I was like, I didn't have anything this weekend. It was like the heavens opened up and it was like seeing hallelujah. And I was like, what was my bright idea? My light bulb went on my head. I was like, oh, I declutter and I'm going to clean the house. So I like literally went and I just was like, there was like, I was like, I'm going to get rid of chicken stuff. This is, I can do this. I can do this. I can get rid of some chicken stuff. So I went around and I got rid of this little chicken platter. I think I got from Target and it was like 
um, like a little thing with like little eggs. And I got rid of so much stuff. Like I went through my hutch and it felt amazing. Like I looked back and I got rid of the clutter on my table. We actually had dinner at my table last night, Shannon. It was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. It's, it's amazing how it all sneaks in. But yeah, I still have an issue with books constantly my husband just rolls his eyes I mean he's like are you gonna get to read oh, yeah I'm gonna read those uh, don't touch them they're in an order I want to read them in but that no they're I, I still it's my one one my one affection auto right it's my one issue so I am working on it I no longer own six thousand books I maybe own a couple hundred so okay and yes, since, I've read those two so <laughs> since you're the book expert since you have so many books what book would you recommend for business profit first hands down I agree and story Agreed. brand story brand would be next and um i read super fans i cut it with pat flynn could have left it or it wasn't my favorite i've read traction traffic secrets i've read um i'm cheating and looking down here because i'm in my office is that yeah. your six thousand books that you're looking at no i don't have them i legitimately like donated all of them almost all wow. of them i only have like 200 and i try to keep it under the 200 mark so that i don't because I'll just keep buying them. I'm like, oh, I like this one. I read this one last time. I'm going to read it again. And then, you know. <laughs> See, with me, I buy a book and it takes me like a year just to read through a little book that's like super page thin. Oh, really? I read, Um, my cousin, who is a voracious reader, never played Scrabble with her. She's vicious. <laughs> she reads, <laughs> I want to say she probably reads about 400 to 500 books a year. Oh I probably gosh. average about 100 um, and, and sometimes it's, you know, I'll be, I'll admit it. Sometimes it's trashy romance. Other times it's whatever I'm interested in. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I'm up in the middle of the night. You guys all know I have a 19 year old dog. So it takes me a while to fall back asleep. So trashy romance usually does it because it's the same story and it yep, repeats the same itself story over and over. So I need the, the lull of the story. And then I'm like yawning. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> oh my gosh that is but hilarious. yeah it's um I think right now I'm reading Outlander the last two books of Outlander so um because I watched the series and there's still so much in the book that didn't happen in the series so when they finally release the last you know chapter of Outlander I at least will know what's going to happen and have the backstory to fill in with the movie <laughs> I'm one of those dorks. <laughs> I wish I had your your wheel I I do listen to a lot of like books just like audiobooks I do that too um but if I really want to get into the book I will have the book and I will outline it and I'll write in it so but it's just like now that things are slowing down Shannon I might actually be able to finish that little thin book that I've been working on for a year I'll keep you all updated <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah so the, so that's that's my vice is um knowledge knowledge is uh, knowledge is power it's the one thing that no one can take away from you no matter what right so um there's going to be occasions where you're going to walk in and there's going to be a collection of some sort some collections that are really valuable are usually in glass cases in the 90s and the 2000s mary maid was notorious for hey let let us clean out your curio cabinet we don't touch collectibles nope don't touch pieces of antiquity we don't touch fine art i worked for the metropolitan museum of art for many many years and um there's a certain way to handle fine art and you don't want to be the one that ruins no. a piece of history <laughs> because it's not replaceable your insurance company will give a value to it and then they'll drop you after but that's never going to be the full value of what that piece of art is and many clients as you become aware of fine art you'll see a picasso or van gogh or um, Rumsky or any of those other, um, you know, popular artists, mm -hmm. the impressionists. I mean, there's, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can um, really appreciate. So there's certain ways to handle them. For a long time, I had um, there one, I think he's finally passed away. He was in his eighties when I knew him. And this was over a decade ago. <clears throat> Ed and um, Helen <clears throat> used to be archeologists in his eighties. Now they used to fly back to her Island in Hawaii and they were in charge of um, documenting all the archaeological digs on the main island of Oahu. And she oh, was wow. in the 70s. <laughs> oh, wow. It's the two of them, you know, digging with their picks. And it was all volunteer. And we would have stories to always exchange. But he was, his name was Ed Stasak. And he actually was a fine artist. And he would let me once in a while go down into his studio. Oh, cool. And I could see, like, the pieces of art. And he would tell me the stories behind it. Because he was a 
avid storyteller. And so when you put the story with the art and you're looking at it, so anytime I had someone come into the house, I would have to explain how to handle fine art. And I go, when you go to a museum and you see those bars there, it's not for you to step over. <laughs> That's a, they call those trip bars. So that if you were to fall and get too close, the natural inclination for those of you who are not watching is to put your hand out forwards to prevent yourself from falling. You don't want to be the one that ruins, you know, the Mona Lisa, right? <laughs> right. Like, that's why or you have to get a piece of pottery. Out. I get to see it like, <clears throat> right. and then like, right. So, so there, there's a way to handle pieces of antiquity and pieces of fine art. But what we're really here to talk about, I kind of segued over in a different direction. Let's reel it back in. Um, yeah, is come this on, Shannon. Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to go down those rabbit holes. I just do. Um, so you're going to see um, collection plates. We had um, Betty Sue who had 137 perfume bottles all lined up meticulously in her bathroom that had to be individually hand wiped. It took three photos and they had to be done once a week. So it took just an hour and a half <laughs> to and you couldn't feather dust them it was like oh never take on a client like that I didn't well, you know I was doing business I didn't know any better and then you know I was gonna say because I started out with this couple and they had two kids and their house was like really nice and neat and there was like hardly any clutter and then it was like after you know cleaning for them for two years her bathroom stuff she got carried away and kept buying more and more bathroom stuff like it was like the clutter like the clutter started growing like makeups lotions makeups everything and it was like I would literally take my arm and those of you guys are not watching I would take my arm and scoop it and try to move it to clean it and then the next thing you know I come back though you know in two weeks I come back and then she's got this carousel this huge three tier three three tier carousel and she has all her stuff in there I was like I am not cleaning all that stuff and so like I'll tell you my little secret is I use an air um, for, you know, the computer keyboard air gun. Yep. So I actually use that to get all the dust and stuff off. But I ended up having to raise their rates because it took me so long to clean the things in her bathroom because she kept adding more and more stuff. So, you know, and, and the, there's several, I mean, you, we all have one. I mean, there's Mickey named after Mickey Mouse, who had the whole Mickey collection because her dad was um, a cartoonist for Walt Disney. And it was like this, you know, and th there were proud moments of touching each thing. And you were just like, I don't want to touch any of this stuff. Right. <laughs> right. Or, you know, the collector Elvis plates, you know, we don't touch collector plates. There's a lot of reasons for that. But the whole premise behind what we're describing you know, with all the crazy stories is if you come into a room that has 70% clutter on any surface, we deserve the right to skip that area. And, and it's in the paperwork. It's mentioned in um, the cleaning contract um, bundle that's right on my website. And, and it's, it's called the 70% clutter rule. So for example, if you come into a house, usually I see this around tax time or I used to anyway, um, maybe it's different now because everyone's more digital, but they would have all of their papers covering yeah. the dining room table or they were an attorney or they were working on a case we would just skip the dining room table that time because it was 100% covered, not just 70%. Or they're working on a sewing project and you don't want to mess it up. Or they're organizing family photos. Or, or it's a business owner like me that has products all over the kitchen table. Right. It happens when you're <laughs> doing production, right? So, so you would just say, hey, I want to let you know that I skipped it this time because it's covered with all this stuff. And nine times out of 10, they're going to say, oh yeah, I forgot about it because they don't. It's been sitting there so long they don't see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you just have to remind them why you didn't touch it so they don't call and ream you later and go, oh, well, you didn't, she didn't clean the dining room table. Like the guy with the cash, right? There was a guy here in town and we were in Arizona. So everybody has firearms and he left a good significant amount of cash sitting on his bed and firearms. And he called me and dreams me one. He's like, you guys didn't change your sheets. I'm like, here's the photo that my cleaning tech sent me thought you should know <laughs> it's just like i no don't know where he got the lot of cash know. at that's what i want to know <laughs> it was a lot of cash right i guess on the amount of cash and then it got the oh sorry right it's just like give me a break <laughs> we don't want to touch your drug paraphernalia either so blair <laughs>
Oh, crazy, hilarious. crazy stuff. You know, there's one guy who had a bunch of bongs. I mean, there's a whole like dynamic with that. In some states, if you touch that, it's illegal. So um, make sure that you are not putting your cleaning techs in a position where they're inadvertently breaking the law. And it's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to take care of your own stuff. Nobody wants to be responsible for cleaning out your bongs. I don't care. <laughs> You're like well, that's not in the job description that is cool. and you have the, you have the right to say no that is the whole point yeah. it's like when you go into a retail location or a, a an old mom or pop restaurant we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone so if you're going to be a dick <laughs> you're not going to get you're not going to get you know your stuff done it's just how it is yeah clutter is is time consuming so really factor that in you guys just like if you see this stuff and like i said i like using my little air you know, gun thingy. Right. Um, charge for it if you're going to do it. Yeah, exactly. Charge for that. Know your time. When you walk in there, be prepared, take notes. So, you know, um, if, if they're doing, for instance, Shannon, if they're doing like, we you know how we did the mock call, like many, many, many podcasts ago, um, what would be a good question for them to ask, you know, during the phone call about their clutter? If they're doing an online, but usually they'll say, if there's an issue, <clears throat> if there's usually a lead in, um, we typically take on about 10 a year where someone has gotten themselves in a situation and it's embarrassing. And so they're finally brave enough to reach out to whoever the cleaning company is. And typically, um, unfortunately, uh, with those types of cleanings, those have to be supervised. So you have to have either yourself as a business owner, go over there and handle that type of cleaning with another individual um, because you want to make sure that there's no judgment that's being handed out um, because they're already feeling vulnerable and raw and overwhelmed and they have anxiety and there's a lot of stuff that's going on internally that you don't really know and they can set off really easy. So you have to be able to know how to handle that element of the clutter and then you have to know how to handle the other part of the clutter, the physical part, the how to pick up all the trash first, how many trash bags you think you're going to need. You need to go to Costco first and get a whole box. <laughs> have a and plan of action <laughs> right and then then there's always it's usually trash um and it's usually fast food containers trash um wine, with the last one we did had a bunch of wine bottles i believe it's on my google business page <laughs> and then it's laundry laundry is the second largest clutter laundry fairy never shows up at my house ever <laughs> Darn. So, do i need to have a talk with the cleaning the the laundry fairy fairy oh fairy? totally she's mia most of the time she's probably in the closet drinking the wine bottles right so um so it's usually <laughs> it's usually that type of clutter so there's usually you can categorize it so it's usually trash and then it's usually laundry and then it's dishes they will have burned through and, and, and this happens too with, you know, depression and those types of things that people get on and off their meds. Um, usually it's dishes. So the dishes will, um, and, and depending on your stomach, some people can handle really gross dishes and other people like, oh no, I'm going to scoop this off the counter and just throw it into the trash. <laughs> but you decide which, what you can do. Um, and nine times out of 10, I don't know why when you take on those types of cleanings, the dishwasher never works. I never. Um, or they don't have a dishwasher. Or they don't have a dishwasher. So you're trying to get like maggots and disgusting things. And even with your long counter, on, you know, and that gag reflex comes up and you're like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> see, I can handle the kitchen, anything in the kitchen. I'm good. But it's like blood. I just can't do blood. That's why I do not do crime scene cleanups. Right. I can't, I can't do it either. I have too graphic of imagination. Um, and I've had several people reach out and they're like, when are you going to teach us? I'm like, I probably never will. Um, I, I've looked at it. <laughs> You're like, if you want me to barf halfway through. Yeah, I'm not a, a good candidate. Like I could never, if I was not doing what I'm doing now and I applied to be a cleaning tech, I would not be a good candidate because I probably would be like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and then the, the energy is, I'm really sensitive to that stuff. So I, I don't think I could probably ever do it, but by all means, the people who do do it are, you know, it's, They're it's awesome. they always the, the, in private, we always talk because everybody tells me everything. Um, but they, the hardest part is for them to find, you think it's hard for us to find help. <laughs> it's even more difficult for those guys because you have to be upfront. Like you're going to see a lot of horrific things. Special training. Yep. <laughs> it's like, are you able to handle it? And then knowing how to handle pathogens and not cross contaminate or spill it on your face on axe. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> as we lead you into me up shannon <laughs> you crack me up so yeah um, just 
the whole clutter is just like know and be prepared because you never know what you're going to walk into you guys and if it's something that you can't do like if you walk in there and you're like this is way over my head for what I've been trained for it's okay you guys to say no and say you know what I'm sorry you know I appreciate your time but I can refer you to somebody that specializes with this type of clean Right. And it's okay to do that. And that happens too. Sometimes they say they're going to prep and then they don't. You walk in and it's beyond the scope of what you're allowed to do. Um, make sure that you understand what those boundaries are. Or like Kim said, you walk in and they you, that they prepped, sort of. They move one plate from here to there. <laughs> and they say, here you go. So you decide. It, it all depends on if you're emotionally capable of handling whatever the situation is and how much you're going to charge them. By all means, please don't do them for dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> we see it all of the time. <laughs> I, mean, I was just talking about it yesterday in one of the other groups. I'm like, always price higher than what you think it would be because you can go down on the price. But if you bid too low, there is no raising it. And it's hard to raise it back up. You, you can, but there's a tiptoe way of doing it. Mm. And there's always the opportunity of them throwing you out. So um, I, I always leave it open. I always recommend giving a range yep. and it's a site unseen. We reserve the right to adjust this price accordingly. Mm-hmm. So that way that they know that there is potential and you're going to have the homeowner who doesn't want to pay because there's been whatever traumatic experience leading up to this whole incident. Like I mentioned, the lady with the um, ozone machine, uh, I think it was a podcast or two back and she was upset because her uncle or her grandfather, I don't remember who it was, or maybe it was her father-in-law had passed away in the home. And and then there's this whole dynamic of dealing with all that stuff. It's traumatizing. It's not easy to deal with death as it is. Then when you're dealing with death with someone who didn't prepare um, for their eminent demise, then it becomes even more of a chore. Like my father, my dad, my dad died young. He was 58. Um, My dad was a big big Scotsman. He was six foot five, total ginger. And he was big. He was a big intimidating man. I've mentioned before how I didn't get to have very many dates when I was in high school because he would scare them. (laughs) The boys would never come back ever. (laughs) So, um, and and my dad, and you know, my dad enjoyed it because he was just a big guy and he died from a massive heart attack. And this, this will tell you his mental state when he died. Um, he was living in an office that had been converted halfway home, halfway office because it was cheaper at the time. And then he let like four or five people move in with him to help him pay the rent. And then you could, it was like a whole conglomerate of mentally ill people living together who were like ticking time bombs. So um, my dad died uh, of a massive heart attack at 58. He was really young. And um, he also left a lot of things unfinished. And I can speak from experience And I would say this was my first hoarding clean, right? (laughs) So it was a a 30,000 square foot warehouse from floor to ceiling full of crap that he was going to get around to. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And he had like, I want to believe he had nine or 10 cars. He had um, mobile um, devices for people to sit on a ride. He had wheelchairs. He had pieces of chandeliers, ceiling fans. But when you walked into the main unit where everyone was living, everything was kind of, um, it was like a scene in a movie. I was like, what? This isn't the guy that I left at, that I knew as a kid. It's, oh my gosh. But yeah, he uh, there was paper everywhere and the people he was living with smoked ciggies. And I was always worried that they were going to catch the papers on fire. It was just like, it's just crazy. So that's how you got your feet wet for cleaning then, huh, Shannon? Right. That's, uh, that's how kind of the evolution of all that started. And that was in my thirties. I went through a whole period of time where I lost 12 people all in a year's time. So um, you you just never know what you're going to walk into and you have the right to say no. This is the, that was the very long dissertation of what I was trying to say. Um, you can say no. It's, you know, this is beyond the scope of what we normally do. I don't feel comfortable doing this or whatever it is. Just try to be polite and dignified and give them an opportunity to save face because it's, yeah, you're, they're sticking it out there in the wind and it's not comfortable ever. So Shannon, I'm sure people have questions. So like if they were to walk into a room, like they're walking to these houses and it was just like clutter, like grandma clutter kind of things, you know, where they have like, you know, the crocheted, um, but they have the crocheted, sorry guys, my golden, my golden retriever puppy is like seriously on my lap right now. Um, if you guys are watching, so like, you know, how you walk into the bathroom and they've got the crocheted toilet seat cover and 
they've got carpet like the, little, in the, bathroom. Yep, the carpet and you know what would you recommend you know if these people do want to clean and it is cluttered but not like a hoarder situation how would you recommend them like pricing stuff like that um that's when you walk back and, and this is i've only been thrown off one property in over my over decade of business that's when you walk back after you walk it because we remember ladies and gentlemen i don't we don't do in-person bidding I just don't have time. We cover the whole state of Arizona. There is no way I physically could drive down to Tucson to go look at a property. <laughs> it's just oh, come not, on, Shannon. four hours away, four hours up back. It's not worth it, right? Yeah. Um, so everything we do is sight and scene. So when you arrive on the job and um, you say that this is why I always give a starting price that starts, you know, top to bottom, deluxe cleaning, start at 325 and go up from there. And then the, the, all they hear, the homeowner ha says is uh, all they heard was 325. They're not listening. They've you've solved their problem. You've got them on the calendar. You've closed the deal. You've got the credit card, but that's all they hear, right? So yeah, when you yeah. wrap it, you immediately teach yourself or your cleaning tech to walk it. And then that's when the negotiation starts. This is part of the process. Do not be afraid to negotiate. Once you say it's going to be 325, don't stick to it and go, oh my God, I got to honor this at 325. No way. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. So that's when you say, hey, just let you know, this isn't going to be the price that we discussed over the phone. And then you have to wait and give them the 10 second pause. It's the hardest part. Count to 10 in your head and wait for them to respond. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> and then when they say, well, what do you think it's going to be is usually the next question. Say, I think it's going to be around 550 to 675 bucks. And then you have to wait again for the other pause, right? The and then they'll say, okay. And then if they, if you can read body language, cause you're in person, if you're doing this yourself and if the body seems questionable, then you can say, well, we will try Kim's dogs are fighting in the background. <laughs> I, I feel like Dr. Doolittle, those of you guys that are not here and I can't see me, I literally have my cats next to me and I've got my two dogs. The only thing that's, not here, is, <laughs> the only thing that's not here is chickens and ducks in my, my office. Space. Sorry, oh my you guys. It's pretty hilarious. Sorry. I'm getting distracted by watching them go back and Sorry. forth. <laughs> but it's, it's just that that's your opportunity. And if they feel like they're questioning the price on why it's going to be doubled or significantly more, just look them straight in the face and give them the pause and then say, of course, we'll try to work as quickly as possible to the originally quoted price that that implies that you're going to work fast, even though you know that you're not going to, because your production rates, when it's cluttered, is going to be one to 200 square feet per hour. Yep. But you're not going to say that to the client. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then you can get them a final price at the end and say, well, I'm more than happy to get you a final price at the end of the day. And usually nine times out of 10, so 99.999% of the time, but okay. But then you're going to have the one person who is like, no way, get out. And I literally have had that happen one time and I've done over, what is it? 12,000 top to bottom of the legs cleaning. That's crazy, Shannon. You got kicked. I've never been kicked out. Dang, girl. Yeah, you need to leave. I still kept the deposit because <laughs> I had the, all of the paperwork signed. So if I show, if we show up to the property and they throw us off the property, that is mine, that deposit. We charge you for a full cleaning. That's good. You guys hear that? Right, you guys hear that charge for a full cleaning as a deposit and if they kick you out you have the right to keep that deposit right because they threw it's, it's called up. a show up fee or if you show up and there's no water and electricity had that happen how many of us have done a post-construction cleaning I'm raising my hand here with no raising water my hand. Electricity, does it not blow <laughs> <laughs> in the heat of summer in the dark <laughs> oh my gosh yeah and then you have to like embarrassedly go to the neighbors or go find electricity somewhere or go hunt down water and then you're carrying buckets of water. No, I had, um, we did one and only one. And we, um, I had a hose in the back of my car. So we were lucky enough to have the hose and I had to go ask the neighbor who I had to pay for the water uh, before I even pay got paid. Water. This oh is, you gosh. know, I had to pay for the water, but this is before I had all these policies in place. And I had to pray that the guy, the real estate agent, and I'm not a fan of real estate agents. You guys all know that. Um, had to, you know, I had to add it onto the bill and he's like, well, that's the cost of doing business. I go, actually, you should have had water and electricity on. So it became like this whole dynamic. He didn't care as long as it wasn't him. Right. So <laughs> it was just like, it was, it was really kind of crazy. So yeah. in in the dark, we had to fill up five um, Home Depot buckets and fill them up. And then we're in the dark trying to clean, trying to figure that out. Right. <laughs> it's just like, it really is crazy. So clutter can affect your energy too. So when you have a nice, clean and cluttered free home, your energy 
and your vibration and your prosperity is automatically going to improve. When you have your home full of clutter, the energy can't flow. And this is direct quote from my feng shui master. And you're, you're inhibiting your prosperity. Just like with your oven, your stove top should always be cleaned because in most countries, and you don't think about this because we're spoiled as Americans, most countries don't have a stove top still to this day. They have either a two burner or a one burner thing. And that one person is using a pot. That's why everything comes cooked in one pot, right? Because there isn't, Mm -hmm. we don't have the luxury of having eight burners or four burners. Um, So keeping your oven stovetop clean helps with your prosperity. According to my feng shui master, I try to keep my, you know what? I felt that same way though, Shannon, like I just have been nonstop. Those of you guys know that summer is one of my busiest times because I do the farmer's markets and I do events, back-to-back events. And then on top of that, we have the online orders. So I'm literally working seven days a week. So I want you guys to think about this. I have two teenagers that work and they go to school and they're busy. So they still have their chores, but sometimes they always didn't get done. And then husbands, yes, sometimes they help. (laughs) Mark's not listening they try to help and I'm not gonna lie to you guys my house was a cluttered mess and it gave me anxiety I would walk in the house and there would be times that I would literally break down and bawl like Shannon knows this I'd break down and bawl my eyes out because I can't stand clutter I don't like my house dirty and I had a hard time functioning to focus on work to get my work stuff done because I would look around me and I'd feel like the walls were closing in so that's so true you guys when that clutter is gone and you guys reduce that clutter you're going to not only make your clients feel like they can breathe like their house is going to breathe again but it's going to bring that sense of peace and it's going to bring that joy back and there's less to manage so you have free time (laughs) you're not constantly managing it's like a, a it's a weird dynamic um when you have large collections there there, and I've seen it happen where we've had I've had clients for many many years and it becomes an obsession with them about the collection of whatever it is that they are a steward for and and it becomes you know they count them I've there was the lady who left me the bad review on I believe it was Angelus that's probably still there under my old company Castle Keeper Cleaning if you guys look, look let me know but um, that was with uh, a cleaning tech who was actually a W-2 who she had all the Indian pots and she knocked one off and didn't say anything and just put it in the trash. And it became an obsession for her. She counted those pots wow. every morning and every evening. I'm like, I don't want to be tied down to life is too short. <laughs> I just, I'm not I, that bad, Shannon. I cannot tell you how many chickens I have. Sorry, you guys. I have no <laughs> idea how many chickens I have, including the live ones. But you don't go around counting them, right? No. It, it's just this, it becomes like an obsession for some people. And then it becomes like this, this thing of this feeling of, you know, I have to do this. Um, We've all come across, like my grandmother, my grandmother could not leave the house if there was a dirty dish left in the mm-hmm. sink. It bothered her. It was the only thing, and, you know, my, my grandmother was raised in the depression, right? So there was a, it just becomes a dynamic of, you know, obsessing over, what is going to work for you and whatnot. And everyone has trigger points of what that is, right? If you came in my office and started flicking books around, I might not be happy with you. (laughs) Uh, My trigger is, and I know this sounds crazy, but when I was a teenager, I went to one of my friend's house and she lived on the really poor side of town, but they left food out and dishes, dirty dishes all over the counter and the sinks. And there was cockroaches like running around. And I got so grossed out of that. So now like my thing is, is that my kitchen has to be miraculously clean. Like I'm telling you scrubbed before I even go to bed. And there's so many times my husband's like, just come sit down and relax. And I'm like, no, I'm like, do you remember the story about when I was a teenager and there's cockroaches everywhere? I don't want cockroaches in my house. And we live literally, we're surrounded where I live, surrounded by farms. So there's mice. And I'm like, I don't want no flipping mice on my counter. So no, I'm going to clean this kitchen. I don't care if it's still midnight. (laughs) My aunt Lorraine, I love her to death. She um, was visiting when her girlfriends, excuse me, out in Chino Valley. And they had just had a nice little, she had had a tea, um, her and her girlfriends. So my aunt is, I think, 79 this year. And so this was, you know, probably five or six years ago. So she and her girlfriends got all dressed up and had tea at her friend's house out in Chino Valley. And they said, oh my gosh, how was the tea at Mary Lou's house? And she goes, oh my God, I have something to tell you. And I was like, 
oh gossip right <laughs> <You're> like, <"Ooh." laughs> right i'm like oh so what had happened so. was there a spit for spat you just never know what kind of tidbit of information people tell you well what had happened is um she had a dog her girlfriend who had the tea had dogs so whatever was left over she would put the plate on the floor and let the dogs lick on it so the problem was is that when the dog was done licking it, she didn't wash the plate. She put it back in the clean dish pile. Oh, that is, that is a uh, uh, moment. My Aunt Lorraine never knew this until she went oh. to the house and she goes, do you know how many rum cakes I have taken from her? I'm like, well, at least you got snarkered. Oh. <laughs> I was just like, did I eat yeah. the cake? I not eat the cake? <laughs> so you never know what people's habits are until you watch them in action. <laughs> We have relatives who um, have been married in and we've gone to their house and they literally, um, there's always leftovers. Well, one time I watched her bagging up the leftovers to distribute amongst the family because it's usually like 50 or 60 people there and everyone brings something to potluck. Well, she sits and picks off and eats and then with her same hand takes a piece again and then feeds her dogs and then doesn't wash in between and then continues on. So I no longer, and I didn't know this. <laughs> so we no longer take, I'm like, oh, I'm on a diet. <laughs> we no right. longer take leftovers from family gatherings over there. <laughs> <laughs> See, you guys have to love cleaning business life. We just tell you all these crazy stories and I'm sure you guys are laughing so hard right now. Like, If you I'm can sure. relate, reach out. <laughs> I know, right? Oh my gosh. Oh my what gosh. Well, that we've been, what, we've been, it's almost been an hour. It went by really fast. Yeah. All our cute stories. Um, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, guys, I'm, I'm offering, I wanted to do something special for all our cleaning business life listeners. And if you guys are interested in pure evergreen, I want to give you guys a coupon code for free shipping. So I'll have Shannon, I'll send the Shannon the link to put in the notes and stuff. And you guys can use that for free shipping. Cause I want to see how many of you listeners out there that love Pure Evergreen. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome sauce. And I'm still looking for um, haunted Halloween house cleaning stories. So if you yes. um, ha- are currently cleaning a haunted home or have cleaned a haunted home in the past and want to jump on a zoom so I can get it recorded and put it to a podcast um, I'm totally interested in hearing what you have to say so that I've gotten three good stories so far. So I've checked the audio for one. It's good. I haven't checked the audio for the other two. So hopefully keep your fingers crossed, but there's some amazing stories. So you, you, either you've done a building, a commercial building, a lot of the old West has 1800 um, and beyond um, homes, even on the East coast. So if you've done one of those and you want to be featured in a podcast, I'm more than happy to get you on a zoom call more than likely we won't use the visual of it except for clips um but because that seems to be the big stipulation with i don't want to be recorded i'm like you can put your photo up on zoom and no one will see (laughs) who you are um so uh, we have that um coming up in october so i'm excited to I'm, i'm hoping to get eight stories so um we shall see what i get i can't wait to hear those i'm excited to hear those yeah thank you guys Thank you guys for joining us. And again, we're still looking for some more sponsors. Yes. Um, so please reach out, you guys. Uh, we are excited to have some sponsors. And if you know somebody that would like to be a guest on our show, we're always looking for guests. If it's so, a good fit. Yes, definitely. There's, okay. I think we got like six or 700 downloads last week. I was really shocked. So we're moving up the ranks. <laughs> Shannon, are we becoming popular? We, we I think we are. I think that's fabulous. Our nerdy selves are becoming popular. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. All right, ladies Have and gentlemen. Good. Thanks for tuning in. You guys take care. Bye.